to start um, this morning with uh, Paul Geringer. He is our legal specialist. He works for the University of Maryland Extension. I think sometimes I feel like we talk daily because always, there's always some legal issue or um, someone has a question about something. And I asked Paul, he's going to cover uh, pesticide litigation, but there's some couple other things that I asked him uh, to cover also. So I'll turn it over to okay. Paul. So good morning, everybody. So yeah, I'm going to talk about some common leasing questions that keep coming up that I keep getting questions on to start with and then do a general legal update as we move along. I'm in the Department of Ag and Resource Economics. I'm an extension specialist. I'm also a part of the Ag Law Education Initiative. There's our information there. I'll keep going through that. None of this is legal advice. We're all good with that, right? We're just going to keep rocking and rolling because it's on TV and you guys will be able to have a video proof. I just said all that. So let's talk about the common leasing questions. We'll talk about those today and then I'll do a general legal update. I'll talk about the Roundup litigation and a few other litigations that have happened in the state over the past year or so. So let's kind of start with the common leasing questions. And I need to start off by saying this directly. Some of these may sound really simple and most of you may know the answers to these already. You would be shocked how many people call my office and ask me these three questions in some form or fashion, at least once or twice a month and, or more than that, depending on the time of year. So the first one is what happens if the landlord sells the property during the life of the lease? What happens in that period? What happens to growing crops at the end of the lease? Um, depending on where we're at in the life of the lease when all this happens and then does the landlord retain the right to re-enter the property during the life of the lease. Um, that one usually almost always comes up when the, land, the previous landlord sells the property and the current landlord has plans for that property as to what they want to do with it later. So the first question, what happens if the landlord sells a property during the life of the lease? Well, the answer is pretty simple. The new landlord steps into the shoes of the old landlord and the new landlord becomes the landlord. So they are the person where checks will be sent to, rental payments will be made to, the lease is still valid. If it's a handshake deal, the handshake deal is still valid. If it's a written lease, the written lease is still valid. Whatever the form it was in, it's still valid. Even if the new landowner was never told about the existing lease on the property, it is still valid. They, the previous owner cannot just forget to mention the lease and not make it be a thing at that point. It still exists. At that point, to get the tenant off the property, they have to give 180 days notice. The General Assembly changed the law last year. As I ask everybody, what is 30 times 6? 180. They just made it days instead of, they went in and changed all the months in the landlord-tenant law, not just for ag, but for residential and everything else, from months into days to make it more clear, because you know sometimes we have a month with more days in it, or a month with less days in it. So it makes it more clear. It changes the date when you have to give notice by one day. So in the past, we would tell everybody give it by July 1. Now it's by June 30th if you do the dates. So I went in and checked it. It's by June 30th now. So that's the only thing to keep in mind that you do have to give six months notice to get off the property or be given it to get off the property. That can be changed with a valid lease. They can be shorter. It can be longer. If there is a written lease with a shorter period, pay attention to it. Now there could be the problem with somebody called last week or two weeks ago with it. Within one sentence, it said that the tenant was to be given four months notice to vacate the property. Okay, that sounds fair. In the next sentence it said, but we can change that to 30 days notice to get the tenant off the property. How many days notice do you actually have to give to give that person to get off the property? We don't know. I've asked four attorneys this question because even I was, I was like, well, how much notice? We think it's four months because our working guess is the landlord wrote the lease, the landlord made it confusing, so the lease will be interpreted against the landlord in that case because the landlord shouldn't have done that. So if it has a shorter period in it, pay attention to make sure the next sentence doesn't just even shorten it even more because what we think happened is the tenant was older, didn't pay attention, and we thought he was getting four months and just ended up with 30 days to get off the property. 
But as I told him, in that case, you're going to have to go to court just to figure out what actual period applies, because it's not actually, actually clear. Ah, if it's in writing, make sure the new landlord gets a copy of it. In many cases, that copy has not been shared. So just always keep that in mind. Any questions on that part? OK. Uh-oh. Oh, I thought there was a sound problem. I use, a, I use a lot of GIFs that make no sense. I love this one now in my class because I can put this one in any slide deck. And this is the moment where I want you to remember it for the test. So I put it in here just so folks could remember it. What if there are growing crops at the end of the lease? The common law view was if we knew the definite time period that a lease was going to end, the tenant did not get to go back on and collect the crops. But there are exceptions to this rule. What are all ag leases? They start off as year to year and then continue year to year after that just until someone gives notice of termination. In almost all cases, we are no longer in this viewpoint because we no longer have a definite termination date. We are going to terminate some point down the road in the future, and we don't know when that date will happen. So we fall into this exception. So this is an equitable doctrine that's designed to protect tenants so they have the right to come back on the property to get, the, get growing crops so they're not taken advantage of in certain situations. So under that doctrine, the former tenant has a right to come back on the property to cultivate, to do whatever is required to take care of the crops and then harvest them after the life of the lease, uh, as long as they were planted before notice of termination was given. If you plant something after notice of termination was given, you did that at your own risk and you are not going to be able to get that crop. But if everything was going along, the crops planted, and the landlord comes along and says, oh, I'm going to terminate the lease, you have the right to come back on and get it. Under this, we have to have three things. We have to have a dot, uh, tenancy for an uncertain duration. We have now reached that in most ag leases because we don't know when they're going to end. That termination has to do, be done, be due to either the act of God or something that the landlord did to terminate the lease. It cannot be through the fault of the tenant. If the tenant did anything to cause the lease to terminate, we do not fall under this doctrine and the tenant does not get the crops, and it all has to be done during the right to occupy it before the notice of termination was given. So as long as we do that, we're pretty good. So it only applies typically to annual crops. It typically applies to grain crops, fruits, vegetables, as long as they're annual. Anything that's perennial, grasses, hay, stuff like that, we're really not going to give you the right to come back on and collect because you planted that knowing the lease could terminate at some point. So at some point, the tenancy has to end. So we really don't include it on past that. I always point out, Maryland has really not well-developed case law on this, but Pennsylvania does. So a lot of this is guesswork as to how Maryland courts would interpret it based off what Pennsylvania has done. And Delaware has even less for those that might also be in Delaware. Oh, any questions on that question? All right, we'll just keep rocking and rolling along. So does the landlord retain the right to reenter the property? As I said, this almost always comes up when the landlord has some future plans for the property, whether that be development or putting their own crop in. In the common law view is if you did not retain the right to reenter the property in the lease, you don't retain the right to reenter the property at any point. What do we do in all ag lease cases? Do you let the landlord come on whenever they want to? Wow, y'all are really tired this morning. It was really late last night. It was late last night. It was a long day yesterday. So in most cases, we usually let the landlord come back on because we want to re-rent the property, typically in some cases. There may be something on the property they still want to access, depending on what it is. So typically, once you do that, we move out of this and we allow the landlord to come back on. So they can come back on when they want to, but typically they need to do it in a way that doesn't interfere with work you have ongoing on the property because they have typically given up most of the rights to use the property during the life of the lease. So whatever they come on to do, typically there may be crop damage. They owe you for the crop damage. 
and figuring out what crop damage is going to be depending on that stages we're at is not always the easiest thing at various points, but there are ways to figure it out. Huh. So what's the best way to fix all this? I got a lot of questions for 8 o'clock in the morning. Communication? Communication is one. What's another way to fix all these problems? <laughs> that's the first time for the last time I have to give this presentation for the year that's the first time somebody has yelled out don't do leases that's, that's the other one I'm going to go with the best is communicate all the parties need to communicate which doesn't always happen in some of these situations the other one is as Jenny said put it in writing write out what the lease is figure out what you want to have happen in the situation what has worked in the past what hasn't worked you know, we're going to hopefully limit some of the disputes. We'll figure out how much notice of termination needs to be given. What's a reasonable amount of time to come back on the property and get growing crops if we're concerned about that. And what all can the landlord can do to come back on the property in certain situations. And there is a book available. I'm sure Jenny still has a lot of copies of this. If nobody has any, I have tons in my office and I'm willing to get rid of them. I don't give them away in one or two books. I give them away in boxes because I just want to get rid of the boxes that are in my office. And you can go online and find it here at, I think it's go.umd, yeah, slash ag lease book. Um, but in it, there's form leases, there's sample termination letters. If anybody needs a Word document, they can get in touch with Jenny or me and I can get it to them. I just didn't put the Word documents online. Any questions on leases? I really. Need a drink. Okay. Oh, we're doing good. Okay, so let's do a general legal update. And Orza call this my ability to work through some of my problems with cases that have been done over the past year. So how many people have seen the ads on TV for the glyphosate litigation? Facebook. Facebook, oh, yeah. online, you know. I'm trying to figure out like what you have to actually do and what you watch on TV to actually figure this out. So we'll go through the history of where the settlement is and then I'll talk about one of the claims in the case near the end that the Supreme Court's going to look at. So in June of 2020, so two years ago, Bayer announced a settlement. They actually announced three settlements on the same day. Did anybody get a settlement in the dicamba drift litigation that was ongoing? So if you did, that was all announced on the same day as this litigation, but they announced about $10 billion to settle the glyphosate litigation currently. I believe currently there's like a close to 100,000 plaintiffs involved in this litigation. So we're looking at $8 to $9 billion just to settle current claims and $1 billion to settle future claims. That initial settlement was rejected by the federal district court that was overseeing the class action litigation, mainly because within it, if you are a future claimant and you are bringing forward a claim as a part of that billion dollar settlement, there was going to be put together a team of experts basically agreed upon by the plaintiffs and then agreed upon by the defendants. So everybody would get to put forward some experts to put on that panel that would then in the end make a decision based on your health claims to determine how much money you should actually get out of the fund. The court rejected that because that took that decision out of the hand of a jury. So traditionally in courts we want 12 people to figure out how much money is owed to you in any decision that the court makes. My argument within this is do you want 12 people who got stuck in jury duty making this decision who may not be scientific experts or would you like a scientific panel making it that decision? So this may be one case where the U.S. legal system really didn't actually work with really what we may be wanting to see happen in some of this where we would want more experts sort of making that decision who have a background in health and some of the issues that could be brought up. So he tried this again, I believe in 2021, yeah, 2021, about a year ago. This time they upped the future claims to $2 billion from everything I could read. And one thing I have to point out, when they make these settlement offers, none of this is public record until it's approved by the court and it goes through some processes. So you really can't see any of this except unless you're in the plaintiff's class. So from everything we could tell, it was going to develop funds for these future claimants between $5,000 and $220,000. And that would be available for up to four years. 
They didn't pay attention to the judge and they brought forward the same scientific panel as well in that one. That one was rejected as well a few months later. Um, we can tell from public filings that Bayer has to make with the SEC that they've kind of upped some of their um, litigation costs and they've actually gotten in trouble with the federal district court a few times because they are work actively working on just settling some of these claims with individual plaintiffs as they come along. So they put about $4.5 billion in just to cover the ongoing claims that they're trying to settle. The other thing that has come up is within this, this is based around some state court decisions in California that then worked their way through the Ninth Circuit that then sort of led to this big class action lawsuit. So within that, the Ninth Circuit upheld a $25 million verdict against a homeowner or against Bayer, against a homeowner who basically ended up getting um, cancer based on alleged, allegedly from the glyphosate usage. Bayer is asking the U.S. Supreme Court to review this because within this, part of the claim in all of this is there's a failure to warn on the part of, Bayer failed to warn that glyphosate could cause cancer. Bayer's argument is within this is what they can put on the label is dictated by federal law. You have to go through EPA. EPA tells you how to, what to put on the label, what directions you have to put on the label. Based on EPA's view, this does not cause cancer, so you do not have to put any cancer warning on it. Because of one health organization saying you have, it could potentially cause cancer, the plaintiffs have argued that is enough to require a cancer warning on the label. And since Bayer did not do that, Bayer is at fault for not warning potential users of the claims. We're waiting to hear if the U.S. Supreme Court will still take that, take that case up. That could be later this year. I haven't seen anything where they have um, announced whether they're going to deny the petition or accept the petition for hearing next year. So we're still waiting to see what will happen there. That will have a huge impact potentially if they do hear it and they find forbear as to where this litigation will go in the future. Ah. The other thing to point out is related to glyphosate is earlier last month, Bayer declared force majeure on their supplier contracts were related to glyphosate. They declared this due to basically, they, they didn't disclose what the issue was, but basically one of their major suppliers that supplies chemicals that then go into the process of build, or making glyphosate um, had a problem. They're not gonna be back online till later this spring, so they're not gonna be able to meet their spring contracts that are currently out there. So they declared force majeure, which is a clause probably in their contracts with their distributors. It's a French term, it means superior force. And typically we use it within contract law to say, up, there's something outside the scope of what we can do to be able to fulfill the contract so we should be able to get out of the contract. They're claiming this based on ongoing supply chain issues with co related to COVID-19 as a reason this, is on, this should be allowed for them to go out. It's within probably the terms of the contract, we don't know, um, yeah. So at this point, we have no idea what's gonna happen, but my major guess is we're gonna have a lot of litigation between the distributors and Bayer just on this issue alone, because there's probably gonna be a lot of distributors upset because a lot of you may not be able to buy glyphosate who are, may have already had it contracted for. So you're gonna be upset with them and asking for money back. They're potentially gonna to wanna to figure out somebody who can pay that money back and it's gonna to go to Bayer. So this is gonna be an ongoing litigation for at least a couple of years. And I haven't seen any cases filed on it yet, but that could happen soon. Okay, let's talk about this poultry farm worker compensation case. So this happened in 2019, if I have all my dates correctly. The Maryland Court of, Spe the first decision was in 2019. The Maryland Court of Special Appeals basically found that a on-farm poultry worker was the co-employee of the um, absentee poultry farm owner and Tyson. The problem in this case was basically the poultry farm worker had developed um, a health injury related to his job on the poultry farm. He came back, claimed workers' comp through the state's unfunded workers' compensation fund. The state's unfunded workers' compensation fund looked around and said, who in this potentially has money to help potentially cover the claim? So they went after the farm owner 
and they went after Tyson. And their argument for Tyson was basically, Tyson is telling this farm worker what to do every day. Tyson has enough control over his employment that he is a co-employee of the poultry farm. How many people have heard of agency principles? Like you can have an agent that goes out and represents you in the world and makes decisions for you. And you can pay somebody to be your agent or you can pick somebody to be your agent. Apparently the Maryland Court of Special Appeals never thought, heard of that and I'm still confused by that. To me, this would be an agency principle here where we have a farm owner who can't be there every day, who's telling this person to go out and do whatever they would do related to what Tyson was telling them. The Court of Appeals in sometime in early 2021 overturned this decision and they based it on the idea that basically, not on what I just brought up, that it would be an agency idea. Um, this had to be heard by a jury. There was enough evidence that the jury could decide that this person was not a co-employee. Um, if you're a co-employee, should the co-employer be able to hire and fire you whenever they need to? Or do you just want an employee to work for you forever and never have that ability? Tyson didn't have any ability to hire or fire this person. They didn't set their wage rate. They didn't have a lot of control over this. In the Court of Appeals decision, they did say there is potentially a case where you could have co-employer situations, but no one could come up with what that situation would be. Tyson couldn't come up with one, and the, the state's unfunded workers' compensation insurance fund could not come up with that either. So it's out there. We don't know what that situation would be, but a court could find it at some point down the road. Then we'll talk about the fun one that's still ongoing. As I point out to my class when I ask them, how did you spend spring, bre spring break of 2021? I spent it trying to figure out air admissions law in the state of Maryland because this decision came out right around that time. So March of last year, the Montgomery County Circuit Court found that the state needs to take into account air admissions from poultry exhaust fans in the water discharge permits. We need to take into account something that's going into the air, into the water discharge permit. And I often ask people this, does anybody know why the Montgomery County Circuit Court can hear this, this, hear this case? This is a permit of general applicability to the entire state of Maryland, so any circuit court can hear it. So you can pick which circuit court you want to have hear it, so they picked Montgomery County. So, the court viewed this, or the judge viewed it on this word admit that was used in the statute within the definition of discharge. To the court, the only way you can admit something is into the air. I would argue you could also admit stuff into the water, and I would argue that probably whenever the General Assembly drafted this law, they put in every synonym for discharge, which admit is a synonym of discharge, just to cover themselves in case somebody came along and was really clever and tried to argue they weren't actually doing a discharge, they were doing something else, so they just put in every synonym for it. But we can't, I can't see how far that goes back because that was about the 80s and the records I have access to, I actually have to call the General Assembly's office to go through public records to get them and haven't had time to do that. The court agreed with arguments made by the plaintiffs that these ammonia emissions coming out of these exhaust fans will go into the air and then eventually come back down into covered waters. That would require this permit to come into play. The problem with all this is, one, and I looked this up, this wasn't actually in the, this first part wasn't in the court's opinion, really. Um, EPA's view of this is it's a non-point source issue at that point. So we have an exhaust fan, putting out the emission, that's a point source under the Clean Air Act. But once it goes into the water, or once it goes into the air and comes back down, it becomes like runoff off a field. It's a non-point source pollution. EPA has no control over regulating non-point source pollution in this. Um, only the state would and the state did not want to do that in this case. So in these past court decisions within it, they looked at these past court decisions. The major one was one out of the Tenth Circuit. I believe it was out of Utah. It was a federal district court case. In that case, they were incinerating weapons. And within it, they had to get a Clean Air Act permit 
And then the plaintiffs who were against what was going on argued that not only did they need a Clean Air Act permit, but the, the, the dust from this weapons incineration would go back into this river, so they also needed a Clean Water Act permit to do it. The court pointed out that no, they did what they had to do under the Clean Air Act. They got the permit. We weren't going to force them to get two permits just because something could go back in the water. With poultry, we're dealing with something that's exempt under the Clean Air Act. There is no requirement to go get a permit on that. So we really shouldn't have to get a permit for the same admissions that are exempt then in the water. This would create huge other problems because potentially this would hit every other industry in the state that had a Clean Water Act permit, not just ag, where the state would have to go back and figure out how these air admissions were gonna go into the water and then develop everything that would go into it for the permits for those. It's currently under an appeal. We're waiting on a decision probably sometime this year from the Maryland Court of Special Appeals. And then this was a special thing Jenny asked me to talk about. I believe it's the only thing you asked me to talk about because it's the only thing I added to my slide deck. <laughs> oh, we still got time, good. So she asked me to talk about hauling fuel on the, the state highways. Um, from what I can tell, there's not a lot out there within public safety and other documents on this. The main things I could find were just make sure the trailer meets all the safety requirements for F and G trailers, make sure the truck meets the standards to be actually be out on the road, to make sure the tank, and I'll talk about why, to make sure the tank's not leaking and causing potentially other problems that could happen down the road. The biggest thing that can end up happening with this is if there's an accident and you're being negligent in any case, that's where we're going to have the biggest issues. And as I point out, negligence is a common law tort, so we have to think about how that is. So it's the failure to ex exercise a standard of care that we would expect a reasonable and prudent person in a similar situation to have exercised. So basically, if it's a fuel case, we would look at how would a normal person, what are the standards they would do this by, how would they have lived their life in going about doing this, and if we figure out everybody would have done it the way you did it, or at least close to the way you did it, typically, you're not at fault. So I throw out what the elements are in a negligence case. You have to have a duty of care to act reasonable under the circumstances of our hauling fuel. We have a duty of care to do it in such a way to be reasonable, to take the safety precautions, such as having everything you know, within the guidelines of the state to be actually out on the road and not leaking fuel. So if there's an accident, we would then look, did you breach that duty of care? Did you do something that created this issue to where that would happen? We're not gonna talk about proximate cause because that's really a hard concept to get in like 15 minutes, but we're looking at what's the foreseeability of this accident actually happening based on the circumstances that actually led to the accident happening and are you within that, whoever was hurt, are they within some sort of zone that they would have been hurt that we normally would have expected? So it's not really, it really depends on the facts in each case. And then were there actual damages? Can we put a monetary value on what actually happened? And I point out, if you fail to meet any one of these, you actually don't have a case. Huh. So that's the biggest thing to think about with hauling fuel. If you run into a leasing question, call me. I'm happy to help. That's think what I've spent most of my week on when I've actually been in the office returning phone calls this week was leasing problems. This week, um, the pesticide litigation is really going to matter down the road. We didn't, I didn't have Paraquat in here, mainly because that's just a new one and it's developing. So there is the Paraquat litigation that's ongoing. There's a few more that are potentially going to develop. So we really do have to think about that. It has had future impacts, at least on glyphosate. It's no longer available to homeowners and residential um, landscapers to utilize. It's only really available for ag still to use. So there is some potential downside to some of this litigation. If you like anything I say through my department, we do a blog and I do a podcast that you can all find at agris.umd.edu. And I'll skip that part. And then this will launch, it's actually up, it's supposed to officially launch next week. At, I think they're highlighting it, some meeting next week. Um, this is a deal, effort being put on by the Southern Extension Economist, um, which we're not technically a part of, but they've adopted Maryland in because I go to the meetings. 
Um, but it's going to be a daily blog that kind of highlights ag policy, ag trade, farm management decisions, vegetable crop decisions, law policy, and I forget a whole host of other things that will come up, but it'll be have a different theme each day with livestock one day, farm policy another day. Um, law usually on Fridays, um, but if you're interested in that, they gave me a QR code so you can scan that with your phone and sign up and you'll get the emails.